I'm here with Rachel Cole Wilkin, who makes one of the most interesting tours in all of London. Uh, Rachel, what are we going to see today? We are going to see toilets and all things related. Oh, let's go to the five best places where you can learn all the... Blue lore. Blue lore. All right, let's do this. We are now just at the border of the city of Westminster, and I promised you some underground, actually functioning public toilets. So here they are. We've got the gents right over here. Um, and this design is very classic late 1800s, really up through the 1950s. And it became popular sort of because it's very discreet. It's tucked away underground, so all you see is a pretty iron railing. Could be a subway entrance, could be any number of things. And you'll notice we're in the middle of a traffic island. So we are very literally separated from polite society here. You have to step away from all the nice buildings. So you have your to, privacy. To, so you have your privacy and so nobody has to know too much about what you're doing down here. Mm -hmm. um, these are actually a rare example of currently functioning underground toilets. So a lot of these underground toilets have closed down uh, largely due to the fact that they don't meet modern accessibility requirements to go down a lot of steps quite narrow spaces. Uh, so they're more expensive to maintain because they're underground. They're slightly more complicated. They have older plumbing. So councils often close them down, but then they have the spaces left over, and so they have to figure out things to do with them. And in recent years, over about the last 10, 15 years in England, we've had a lot of reimagining of these spaces. So there's a very cool cafe and one where they've actually left all the urinals along the walls. And, they put a sandwich counter around them to actually set up around oh, that's and eat. It's really nice. Um, that's over near Oxford Street. It's called the Attendant. Uh, there's several bars, one of which we go to on my tour, that are former underground toilets. There's an art gallery in Kennington, South London. Oh, wow. um, they, 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 it's pretty much just the old toilet. The doors and all the fittings are still in there, but they have artists come and do installations. Um, and there's a woman in Crystal Palace who's turned one into a house. So um, she actually lives in one. They, I don't know if they have on this one. She owns it. A lot of them have sort of glass skylights, which we don't have here. Glass skylights here. Um, I can show you some a little bit later on. So they get a bit of natural light in, and they're actually quite spacious off inside. Um, the only downside to all these cool reimaginings is oftentimes when these public toilets get closed down, they don't get replaced necessarily with anything, so... So you have to go to the pub. Out, or you go to the pub. Or the Starbucks. Um, or the Starbucks, or the McDonald's. Somebody <laughs> taught me the phrase, a McWee, the other day, which I think is um, awesome. <laughs> I'm doing for a McWee. Let's <laughs> go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We can check out sometimes, and I haven't been in this one, but sometimes they have very nice mosaics on the oh, wall. Oh, you do? So okay. Let's, let's see what we find. off for going in the gents. <laughs> I mean, are, are, has London moved to gender neutral bathrooms yet? Um, in some places, not very many. Oh no, we've been down here before, this is interesting. So here um, is the... Here gents. is the facility, as you can see it costs 50 pence, which is true of every public toilet in Westminster, not in London, but in mm. Westminster every public toilet. Oh, there you go, there's this is a spacious. little bit of no art on the they... wall there. No wonder they fit um, bars in here. So you've got a sort of 1920s, 1930s couple over there in the corner on this nice little painting. Outside the Royal Court of Justice. And, you know, what do they fit, like, the entire yeah. bar in here? This is massive. This is bigger than most public bathrooms in America. Oh, yeah. So why does uh, London take its uh, bathroom so seriously? Um, we have... Or used to. A, well... Huge population, but no, I can't talk anymore. Huge population for a start. Um, so around the time public toilets were becoming common in the 1800s, London had gone from just under a million people at the turn of the century, mm. over two million by 1850. And what are often hailed as the first public toilets, even though they weren't really, were at this exhibition called the Crystal Palace in 1851 mm -hmm. and uh, this is Britain sort of at the height of the British Empire a chance to show off all that was great and glorious about this wonderful island and so the Crystal Palace had been built and a senator named George Jennings wanted to put retiring rooms into the 
the Palace of St. Albans. Uh, so he installed public toilets, and they were a bit controversial. But they got 827,280 visitors over the six months of the exhibition. Uh, so that sort of sparked an entrepreneurial interest in the idea of having public toilets, so this might be a facility that... At that time, people were coming farther away for exactly. leisure and business. And uh, the flushing toilet, like as we recognize it today, the first patent was taken out in 1775 by a Scottish watchmaker who patented the Juventus, which was revolutionary because that prevented the bad smell from creeping back up. So that makes it a much more attractive thing to have in your home. And by the mid-1800s at the Great Exhibition, um, it had become sort of the model thing that public health performers were suggesting people start to install. So this is a time when they're starting to put together stuff about disease and human excrement and the fact that if you have overflowing cesspits and piles of food sitting in the corner, that's going to make you sick. Yeah, um, to avoid all that and, dirtiness. And yeah, and in fact, a public health performer named Edwin Chadwick wrote that the loss of life from filth and bad ventilation is greater than the loss from death or wounds in any wars this country has been engaged in in modern times. Uh, so it, it really is, and actually remains today in a lot of countries, a really big killer for sanitation. So that, that's why England saw this sort of public toilet craze. They were realizing that actually cleanliness isn't just about being pure and good people, healthy. it's about being healthy. And up till the mid And hence all the beer drinking as well. Hence all the beer drinking. Um, and up till that point, historically, being clean was the way upper classes could really separate themselves from the poor and sort of almost justify their status. We are clean, we are decent, unless there's dirty, immoral, poor people. And Chadwick actually is still from morality, which is a whole other interesting uh, area of exploration. But then around the mid-century, they're realizing, actually, if the poor people are getting sick, that's going to impact us, because of cholera is still going to affect us. Um, so that was a really good incentive to sort of up the game for everybody and to ensure that there was public provision made, um, rather than to say, oh, the underclasses can stay in their slums and do what they're going to do. Let's check out the ladies, just because yeah. we may have interesting mosaics in here as well. Um, until we get arrested for bringing a camera into the ladies' club. <laughs> I might be arrested um, for the ladies. Yeah, maybe we won't go too far. Um, right. We'll just look at this little mural on the wall here. It depicts the local area. Oh, and then we'll make a hasty retreat, lest anybody should think we're peeping around corners. <laughs> Not good ways. The number of times people have said to me, excuse me, ma'am, not the gents. Uh, like, I know, I just want to photograph it. <laughs> so this is a modern example of what London now tries to do, which are coin-operated automatic public toilets. They're on the street. They're usually a prefab facility that gets brought and dumped here. Um, and they're not nearly as glamorous as the other ones. I don't know if we can go around the front. Let's oh, yeah. see if there's still people waiting. Oh, they're off. Perfect. Good timing. I didn't want to alarm people by having a clean. So I was like, I think it's going to do a cleaning cycle now. Let's see. Those? Nope. Maybe. Interesting. It so, was open earlier. Now it's saying it's closed. So these are very finicky sorts of public toilets. So it does um, clean. It like does it's self clean. clean. Self clean. And, and you get only 20 minutes maximum. You get, I know, I love this. You have a 20 minute maximum. So you can't take a good sleep in You there. can't take a sleep. And I think that's part of why they don't want people sleeping or having sex or other things in the toilets, which <laughs> people do. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you've got your list of rules here. So that's exactly how to use it. Um, children under the age of 12 must be accompanied. What else to say about this one? Another clever thing about the cleaning cycle is it prevents you from holding the door for the next person. Mm. So if one person goes in and uses it, the tradition, if you're a nice person, is to hold the door and say, oh yes, you go in. Uh, but yeah. if you have a cleaning cycle in between, then they can't do that, because then the next person then gets a shower, uh, which they <laughs> probably don't want. <laughs> which would suck. So, um, so that's the sort of ulterior motive for that. Mm. That's interesting. Are they? Do you, would you recommend them if you're a tourist to come? I use here? them if I'm desperate. I wouldn't go out of my way to find one. Okay. Um, although, just to point out, and this yeah. is a curious quirk of London. This pet right here does not have a toilet that 
visitors use. So here and there, and you say where to do, they, they point you towards out here. And I'm not even entirely sure if that's legal. The law is here a little bit funny regarding like how many seats you have to have before you're required to allow people to sit down. Exactly. Um, this is the cellar door cocktail bar, but that's not how it started like. So um, originally this was one of London's underground loos. You'll notice there's just one here this is because it probably would have been men only. There's a lot more for men than women. And this one, at least according to the current owners, had a bit of a reputation for being a notorious spot for gentlemen of a certain persuasion to go down looking for romance at a time when it was illegal. Right next to the um, red light district right here in Soho. Right next to the red light district in theater lands. Uh, they like to claim Oscar Wilde as one of their patrons, though I happen to know this is the oh, mid-1900s, yeah. so unlike the that Wilde himself came down. Um, but there's... Still today, I've met people who have almost this nostalgia for cottaging, as it's called here, which was crisps and public toilets. Um, so it still goes on, although thankfully people can do it in other places too now, which I think is a good thing. Um, but Cellar Door, in addition to its heritage as a mood, has amazing toilets of its own. So the doors are completely clear until you lock them and then they crossed over so that you can see through. At and first you're very daunted. So at first you're very daunted and one of the great joys in life, I think, because I'm a bad person, is to sit down there just watching people who don't know head back to the news and, and stand there with an increasingly horrified look on their face and sort of prod it. Then eventually they figure it out, they come out very excited about toilets, which is what I like to see. That's how I feel when I go to a public bathroom and then they don't have the doors attached just because I assume they don't want people to be inside of them. And that's always terrifying, like, you just try to hide as much as possible. Yeah, see, I haven't encountered that as much. I think maybe in ladies' booths, I tend to be a little more private about things. But one thing yeah. that I had never realized was odd until I moved here is in America we have those gaps at the bottom of the door and sort of a gap along the side of the door. Oh, yes. And Brits think that's so weird when I would get asked all the time, <laughs> why? <laughs> why? Because here the doors go from floor to ceiling and they yeah, close. Yeah, I feel very private um, here. Yeah. And I think it's, I give two reasons and I don't know if either or both are accurate. One theory is that it's a surveillance sort of thing so you can see how many feet are in there. You can make sure there's not too many feet for what should be going on in there. Exactly. Um, but also, we are we are a rustic people. We are pioneers. We moved out and made do with what there was. So we <laughs> sort of got away from that Victorian prudery as we must be as closed off as possible. Like, you know everything. Exactly. Um, and we don't go around peeking through the doors. Like I think that's what some people feel like everybody's going to come and look and we, we don't do what that. Are you doing that we don't do that <laughs> next we're going to go to one of London's newest public mm. toilets which has taken a slightly different approach the other. all right we are outside to the loo to the loo is billed as the world's first toilet shop concept and this is one of London's more expensive things you pay a pound to get in once you put your pound into the little turnstile, you're issued with a voucher, which you can redeem on the way out for 70 pence for any item in the shop. Most of your items do cost more than 70 pence, so you will end up spending some money. But this concept was originated in Amsterdam. There was an entrepreneur who was traveling around. He had his wife and child with him, so for the first time realized just how hard it is to find a good toilet stop when you need to go. And because he was a business-oriented guy, he said, I know what we need. We need a line of really high-quality toilets so people will see the brand and they'll recognize it and they will want to go there. So he created two of them. There are about 600 of them across Europe. This is the very first one, as far as I know, in England. And I think it's still the only one. So we'll see whether two of them takes off here. So this is a business? This is a business. This is a big change. Um, and it's, they're very nice inside. That's part of their grand promise. You'll get a nice loo in this one. They have wallpaper for different scenes around Covent Garden in London. They have a children's facility, which has a small toilet and a big toilet. Um, I think it has a disco ball. The one in Amsterdam had a disco ball in the children's one. Oh my God, has I tried that myself. It's sort of soothing. Uh, and small children often have a lot of anxiety around covering toilets, so having somewhere that's pleasant to have a 
and let me have you like walk into the say where the next stop is, but say I gotta take a break okay. before. Um, I have to pick where the next stop is. Okay. Um, I'm gonna show you the other toilet option in Puppy Garden, which is back to the underground ones we were looking at before. First, I'm gonna take a quick break. So we have another example of underground loose here. We're now in Covent Garden, one of the biggest tourist attractions in the West End. And these underground loos again continue that great British tradition of charging for use that can still cost 50 pence to the in Westminster. Again, they're tucked out of the way so they're very discreet. And this is your alternative option to the more expensive Toodaloo over there. For a while I was worried these were going to close down because Toodaloo opened and then these closed for about four months for refurbishment. But one downside of privatized toilets like Toodaloo is that uh, the city sort of goes, well, there's another option, so we don't have to be in charge of it anymore. I'm going to stop providing. Oh, uh, but you asked us about where the word crap comes from. Ooh. That's one of my favorite questions. So many people have heard the name Thomas Crapper, and they may have heard that Thomas Crapper invented the toilet, which is not true. Um, but there was a real live guy named Thomas Crapper. He was born in 1836 trained as a plumber, and then went on to become a sanitary engineer and manufacturer right about the time that flush toilets were becoming really popular. And so he went from being a poor Yorkshire lad to designing toilets for royalty, and by the time he died, he was having champagne breakfasts every day in the pub. And the word crap sort of relates to him, but not originally. So crap was a Middle English word. It's a bit of chuck that you separate from the wheat. And it has come to mean who sort of is like the use of spit that gets thrown away. It's got that connotation. But in England, by the 1800s, it had fallen out of use. So nobody really thought twice about the fact that Thomas Crapper branded all his toilets with his name, had a huge sign that said Crapper in a very posh area of London. But in America, our language evolved differently since we split off and had our revolution. And so we kept a lot of archaic English words, and Crap was one of them. Which brings us up to World War I, when American soldiers were coming over for the first time. They saw a crapper printed on the toilets, and they thought that was hilarious. So they started calling it the crapper, and repopularized the term here. So Thomas Crapper is sort of to thank for keeping the word alive and bringing it back, as well as the Americans as our contributions. He fulfilled his destiny. British. He fulfilled his destiny. <laughs> Um, and that's it, why Americans say um, to do, go to the crapper. Go to the crapper, yeah. It could be what you call a nominative determinism, which means if you have a certain name, you go into a profession. Like if your name is Fry, you open a chippy, or if your name is, I don't know, Smith, Smith you are a blacksmith. Yeah. Um, crapper itself, that name we think is a corruption of proper, so it's likely that his ancestors worked in the field. So I got asked why I carry a toilet plunger. Uh, there's a couple reasons. And actually, the dirty secret is this is a sink plunger, not a toilet plunger. But uh, mainly it's so my tour guests can find me. I lead about five tours a week, and people don't know what I look like, so I just tell them, look for the woman holding the toilet plunger. And so far, there's never been a problem with confusion around that. Um, it also just spreads joy. So as we walk through London with this held high, I get a lot of strange looks. I get a lot of comments. But it makes people smile, so that, in my mind, is a good thing. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to find out more about the tours, we are at lootours.com. London Loo Tours run regularly. We have several walks to choose from, and you can hear these and many more stories about the history of London's sanitation.